Good morning, everybody. Uh, can I just get a thumbs up that you guys can hear me? Thank you, Alan. I can see you. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I hope everyone, I can see there's, there's quite a few people already in the meet. They were very specific about making sure we started the session on time so we could end on time. We have a very short amount of, of time that's been allocated, although I also do know that there were some technical difficulties with the website. So that being said, I know the session is being recorded, so I'm going to get started. And if people come in late, uh, the recording will be available and they can catch up. Uh, so if you are here, hopefully you are here for the Building uh, Visual Media Literacy Skills Workshop. Uh, I'd like to begin today's presentation with a land acknowledgement uh, based on the location from which I'm joining you today, which is Toronto. We acknowledge the land we are joining from is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto or Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. This land acknowledgement is not part of reconciliation. We understand that we have more work to do to uphold our commitment to meaningful reconciliation and to live by the principles of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kim Davidson. I am an elementary school teacher librarian, like most, if not all of you. And I'm also a media literacy specialist with the Toronto District School Board. Um, I have over 20 years of teaching experience, and I have been a teaching consultant with civics for several years now for a variety of programs. Um, that being said, I don't know that I have, a, I have a particularly special set of qualifications or skills that I bring to the table. I am literally just a teacher like you. Um, I think the only difference is, is that I have a lot of experience working with the uh, variety of programs that Civics offers. And so I'm very excited to be able to uh, talk to you a little bit more of, uh, about some of the new things that they've been working on developing and hopefully share some resources that you can take back to use with your own students in your classrooms. So a little bit about civics. Um, for those of you who don't know, civics is a Canadian education charity dedicated to building the habits and skills of citizenship among youth. Um, they do this by creating experiential learning programs and curriculum materials for use in schools across Canada. Uh, the flagship program of civics is Student Vote, and hopefully most, if not all of you, are familiar with the Student Vote program. Um, uh, it is a parallel election program in which students have the opportunity to uh, participate in the actual election process at the same time that grown-ups do. And so in the most recent federal election that we had just last month, over 800,000 students across Canada participated in the Student Vote. Um, other programming that civics provides for uh, staff, uh, teachers and students, uh, the student budget consultation, uh, which supports students in learning about financial literacy. Uh, the rep day program supports teachers in inviting elected representatives into their classrooms. And uh, Democracy Boot Camp, which is one of my favorite events of the year. It's a PD uh, uh, event that they hold in various cities across Canada. Um, and maybe some of you have participated in that. The newest area of program development that uh, Civics has uh, started working in is focused on digital media literacy programming, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Because we know in order for democracy to work, citizens need to be informed and engaged. And so in support of this, Civics has developed what we call the Control F program. And um, for us techies out there, we know that Control F is the uh, shortcut key combination on your keyboard that uh, is the find function. So as TLs, we know when we want to find something really quickly on a website, Control F, and that'll help us search the page more effectively. So uh, in, in connection with that, the Control F program is designed to support students with finding um, accurate, reliable, valid information in uh, a variety of different ways. 
Um, so it teaches students important verification skills for the information that they see and hear online. Initially, the program is targeted towards students in grades 7 to 12, but as you'll see today, many of the resources can be adapted for younger students as well. I personally have used the resources with students as young as grade 4, um, but in theory, you could probably use this with even younger students, the pri our primaries, especially when we're talking about visual literacy, because they're not limited by the ability to need to know how to read. Um, and Civics does have plans to release a elementary specific version of Control F sometime in the next year. So Control F outlines several tools that can help students develop their digital media literacy skills. But in this session in particular, uh, because I could go on and on and on about Control F, in this section, in this session in particular, we're going to focus on visual literacy. Um, we all know that images are powerful. Uh, a picture can inspire an emotion or shape the way we understand people, issues, and events. Um, we have many expressions that describe the impact of visual information. A picture is worth a thousand words, or seeing is believing. Reneem from Ms. Luther's class, could you please gather your things and come to the office? Reneem from Ms. Luther's class, please gather your things and come to the office. I'm so sorry. I'm presenting at school, and I forgot to tell them to turn off the PA system. So there are probably going to be frequent interruptions like that, but we're just going to keep moving on. Um, Photos can seem like truths because they are a record of what's happening. But what we need to caution students and to make them aware of that sometimes seeing isn't believing. Sometimes the, inf the image that were presented to us isn't communicating information accurately. And so we need to make sure we impart critical thinking uh, skills to them so they know how to interpret what they're looking at um, reliably. So our learning goals for today's session, um, we're going to take some time to do some hands on practice. And because, you know, we've all been teaching virtual, I don't know about you guys, but in Toronto last year, I was teaching virtual for the entire school year and I got very used to teaching a whole bunch of black squares and no interaction. But I want you guys to wake up. I want you to participate. I want you to talk to me. Hopefully the chat box is open. Oh, I already see a question in the chat. Is the link downloadable? So this slide deck will be available to you immediately after the presentation. So if I've done this correctly, uh, it, it should be uh, on the um, workshop sites. You'll see a link to my slide deck there. Um, my contact info, I'll post again at the end. So if for some reason the slide deck's not there, you can always email me and I'll be happy to, to, to share it with you. Thanks for the question. So that tells me that the chat box, work, chat box works. Thank you so much for that. Um, so you'll have the opportunity to participate in the discussion, um, share your thoughts, your ideas. Uh, this workshop will be much more fun if we can have a chance to talk to each other. So thank you in advance for not making me feel like I'm just talking into the void. Um, second part of the workshop, we're just going to talk a little bit more about specific, the, specifically the resources that Civics has available. So everything that I'm going to be doing today is in the is available on the News Literacy website. And so I don't want people to be distracted looking at the News Literacy website though before I have the chance to show you stuff. So I promise I will tell you how to find the resources, but we're going to have to do a little bit, going to have to earn them first. Okay, friends. So thank you. Uh, and then finally, there'll be an opportunity for you guys to ask questions at the end. And again, I will post my contact info. So just in case we do run out of time, you can always email me and ask me. And the civics team is also very responsive to questions. Um, you just need to drop an email to hello at civics.ca and you should get a response back within hours. Uh, oh, this was, a uh, yeah, I should have been clicking, sorry. All right, so first question, what's going on in this picture? What do you guys see? Go ahead and drop your ideas in the chat. Some of you may be familiar with this picture. You may have seen it before. Um, and feel free to share. If you know the context of this picture, feel free to show that as well. But this is a great basic way to start having conversations with kids. You know, put a picture up on the screen and ask them to tell you what they see. Okay, another thing that you can also suggest to students is to consider the five W's. Who, what, where, when, and why. 
in the photo. All right. <laughs> oh, this is, see, this is my favorite part when I get people to share. So Trump asking Trudeau for a high five. So first of all, we know the people in this photo. So let's talk about the who. We see Justin Trudeau, who is still our prime minister. And we've got Donald Trump, who is the former president of the United States. Please withhold your cheering applause. Uh, former president of the United, uh, former president of the United States. Uh, so we see here we have Donald Trump asking JT for lunch money. Uh, yes, uh, what an excellent picture. Thank you so much. It's not mine, but it's in the it's in the civic resources. Uh, reluctance. All right, and reluctant. So if I was doing this with students, I would make them be more specific about their what they're talking about. Who's reluctance? I'm going to assume that you're referring to the expression on Justin Trudeau's face, all right? So one thing that I want to just put right out there right from jump is something that I've noticed with my students is they struggle with differentiating between what you see, like what is explicit in the photo, what you know, what you can, and what you think is happening in the photo. And Remember, you know, we've been coaching kids since they were young to create inferences from imaging. That's what a lot of reading is. And so part of what we have to do in media now is break that down and understand it's like, OK, kids, yes, you might want to infer what's happening in the photo, but understand that our inferences are just that there are thoughts, but it's not it's not necessarily factual. We don't know. It's just what we think. All right. So we know that the two people in the photo are Justin Trudeau and Donald Trump. What can we infer? We can infer from Justin Trudeau's face that he is not exactly into this whole situation. We have Donald Trump who's offering his hand, probably for a handshake. And we can see from Justin Trudeau's face, he's not quite feeling it. Or we can infer from his face, he's not quite feeling it. So yeah, Trump being snubbed, did he wash his hands? Uh, this is pre-COVID by the way. So that's something that might be, but interestingly enough, so the time frame of a photo can also bring context. When was this photo taken? Um, Trudeau is deciding whether or not he wants to shake hands. So these are all fantastic ideas. They're so great. I don't have time to go through them all, but they're fantastic. All right. So uh, now I show you this photo. Okay. Now, in the context of the previous photo I just showed you, does this second photo change how you feel about the first one? And if so, how so? Okay, so I'm gonna go back. This was the first photo, okay? And we had our ideas about what was going on. Now I show you this photo. Mm, I like that, Kathleen. So, you know, the, the first photo is kind of behind the scenes. And then the second photo is the uh, on camera, you know, everything has to be perfectly uh, uh, constructed. So that's the constructed photo. In media, we talk about that a lot. The fact that media is constructed and it's created to portray a particular image. Nice, nice. How long was the previous moment lasted? Forced smile doesn't change. Okay, good. Uh, I like this. this is good. Yeah, this shows how politicians can fake it for a photo op. Camera shot came quickly. So you guys are, and this is great. So you can say to students, you can ask students like, which photo do you think represents the reality? of the situation. Do you think the first one was maybe Trudeau was just caught for a split second awkward face? We all know that happens, right? Happens to celebrities all the time. But people take one moment and use it to infer a whole different meaning from what the actual situation could be. So just this example can show students that one moment in time, one photo, is not necessarily enough evidence to convey the truth about a whole situation, okay? Um, other things that you can bring into the conference. So that's one way you can use these photos in a conversation. If you wanna bring it to specific types of media, we can talk about how photo, how images can be used to frame an art news article, all right? So these two images here, um, were taken where are our screen caps of actual front pages of newspapers. 
So you can see how, uh, or new sources, I should say. So you can see how the two news sources, first of all, were very deliberate and specific in the photo they chose to run. And then the words they also chose to highlight in the, um, in the accompanying headline. Okay. So, you know, one question that I, I was thinking to myself and, and I had to actually go back and look it up is it's clear that the first uh, news source is CBC. And it is using the first photo that kind of has a negative connotation about the relationship between Justin Trudeau and Donald Trump. The second photo was used in the second head, the se second front page. And so my question to you is what news source do you think this, this screen cap is from? Where do you think this was located? Okay, Gwen, Gwen says American. And so, of course, then I, you know, my question is, why do you think it's American? Fox. <laughs> America, and I can say this as an American. Oh, okay. Has a very, very uh, strong sense of importance and believes that they have good relationship with everyone because who wouldn't want to be best friends and allies with the US. I uh, like it. Not better at all. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So again, and now these again, these are these are ways that you can convey different ideas and concepts to students. The idea that, you know, if you want to frame a relationship and perspective and bias and point of view, all these things can be introduced through the use of uh, through the use of a uh, visual resource. So thank you everyone for participating in that uh, interaction. There is, of course, other ways that photos like this can be uh, portrayed in the media. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention memes. Um, and let me tell you, uh, Twitter went to town on this first video, on this first uh, photograph between Justin Trudeau and uh, Donald Trump. The images that you see here are just two of the many, many, many examples of how the photo was then remixed, um, things added to it, things taken away. You can see in the first photo, uh, somebody's added a little tiny giraffe uh, to, the, to the picture and then added a caption as well. So again, you can ask students, how do these additions change the meaning of the photo? Okay, and the second one is my personal favorite because you can see in the thought bubble, Justin Trudeau is having a fond reminiscing of the uh, of uh, his relationship with President Obama, which has long been uh, uh, believed to be a much closer relationship than the uh, relationship he had with Donald Trump. But I actually asked another question because I tried to find the source of the photo that's in the in the thought bubble, the bro hug between Barack Obama and Justin Trudeau, and I couldn't find it. So then the question is, is that in itself a construction? Is that photo of Obama and Trudeau hugging in such a way, does that represent reality or has that also been constructed? So all these questions that you can challenge students to start asking. Um, yeah, exactly. And so we're asking really good questions. Can we really know what's happening in a photo? Is there always, isn't there always some element of inferencing? Yes. And so this is something to make students aware of. So you're, you're wanting to challenge this idea of, well, there's a picture of it. So if there's a picture, there has to be proof. That has to be proof. It's evidence. It's proof. Okay. Yeah, definitely looks doctored. Um, Fantastic. All right. So we've been kind of doing this discussion in kind of a loosey goosey way, but sub civics actually has a specific framework that they've developed in order to support teachers with how these conversations can take place with students. So this is the current kind of simplified version. Um, I want to just... <laughs> When we were developing this framework, and when I say we, you know, part of the consultation team, we had lots of debates over how to structure it. Um, I personally um, took issue with the numbering because, yes, it's nice to have a, a structure on how to work through the framework, but I also was concerned that, you know, you can 
a, you can approach the questions or you can approach the questioning from a nonlinear way. So you don't always have to start with one and then go to two and then go to three and then go to four. You'll see in an example we're going to uh, do together that I actually like to jump around depending on what the picture is and what the learning outcome I want to have of that picture. So I just want to make it clear that even though the steps are numbered, it doesn't mean that it has to go in numerical order. It's more kind of indicating the complexity that the conversation can take on, okay? Um, so you have the overall kind of questions uh, under one, two, three, four. And then um, underneath are kind of supporting guiding questions you can use in order to challenge students and, and encourage deeper conversation into the question. Um, there is a more, uh, I don't want to say complicated, there's a more detailed version. This is actually the original version of the framework that came out. I actually like this version better because I like the representation of a circle more than a line. Um, but the, diff the main difference between the intermediate secondary and the simplified is you can see in the bottom right hand corner, this framework adds uh, the social media element. And um, for our younger students, they might not be as exposed to um, social media, although if the use is getting younger and younger and younger. Um, but um, intermediate secondary framework asks questions specifically about, especially about uh, finding the source of where the uh, information or the photo came from, um, because we know with social media images can be shared like that. It can be shared thousands or hundreds of thousands of times. Um, and so it's really important for students to be aware that it had to come from somewhere and to try to figure out where the original source of the picture was. Just a little bit of history about where the framework came from. It was actually developed in partnership with the Visual Social Media Lab, which is a kind of an, an educational think tank out of Manchester in the UK. Um, so Dr. Farida Vies, who actually came and, and uh, worked with us for several weeks and months, it's a, the collaboration is ongoing. Um, she's an expert in visual disinformation, and she's spent years analyzing uh, social media and how, uh, visual how visual literacy has exploded and how um, the uh, use of it is deliberate uh, can be used deliberately for specific purposes, um, both positively and negatively. Um, and so uh, Civics worked with uh, Dr. Vies to adapt a framework that she developed in conjunction with a journalistic verification group known as First Draft. Um, and you can see that the framework was originally quite complicated. I think there's 22 squares there. And so uh, through looking at the individual square, we divide, we figured out a way to combine it so it wasn't quite so complicated and easier for students, our elementary age students to consume. Um, and you can see there's a picture there of uh, Farida doing a presentation as well. Yeah, when you, get, when you get the slide deck, I understand it's a little bit difficult to read it now. And really, you don't want to read the 20 question slide. It is very complicated and you, you don't really need it. What you really want is a simplified framework to work, use with your students. Um, and the inspiration, as always, for this is that we know that mis and disinformation online spreads through memes, manipulated photos, and other visual formats. And so all images can be rich tasks for analysis. So what do I mean? What can you use, what, what can you use this framework with in class? Pretty much anything. Um, because civics is uh, focused on civic education and the impact of uh, mis, and different, mis and disinformation on electoral campaigns, that's where a lot of their examples come from. But just know that this framework really can be used with anything. Uh, Im journalistic images, so pictures from news websites, magazines, newspapers, political cartoons. I love this example of a cartoon. Um, take a minute, have a little chuckle over it. I'm sure it represented, I don't know about you. I mean, I'm a parent too, and this was definitely the reality I felt, felt sending my five-year-old to school on the first day. 
Um, I know you guys are all in BC and I'm not really aware of how, how the impact of COVID on, um, on you guys out in BC, but in out here in Ontario, it's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty, it's had a pretty significant impact on, on education. Uh, other things, historical images, we're going to see an example of that coming up very shortly. Social media, of course. Uh, advertising is another great example of, of being able to find fantastic uh, visual literacy um, examples to use in the class. Memes and, and, and lots more. Okay, the possibilities literally are endless. Oh, you guys are open. Oh, you guys were open all year. Wow, total opposite to us. Oh, thanks, Kelsey. Kelsey from Civics this year, so she can handle all the all the. Uh, I don't want to say mundane, <laughs> exciting logistical stuff. Thanks, Kelsey. Appreciate it. All right. So speaking of historical examples, we're going to do another kind of fun interactive. So this is an old media, and I, I like to say to my students, this is, you know, old school back in the day, newspapers. And, I, you know, I always ask them how many of them still get newspapers at home. Of course, none of them do. Uh, but anyways, there's still a rich source of, of uh, 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 visual uh, examples we can use in the classroom. So first of all, let's go through the basics, all right? What do you see? What is this a picture of? And this one is maybe a little bit more, sometimes it's easier when there's less context, context because literally you're forced to just, what do you actually see? So what do we see in this picture? Feel free to go ahead and, okay, yep, man crouching over. Possibly drop the football, yep. Fumble, missing the catch. Man who just got hit. Yep. I love awkward. Great word. Unsuccessful. Great word. Oh, I love the noticing of the people in the background. So, yep, he's doing it in front of an audience. Yep. Frame. Oh, I like that. The framing of the photo. So, noticing that the other people in the photo are actually framed higher than he is. Oh, this is some advanced level stuff. Nice. Yep. He's got a very pained expression on his face. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, Kathleen. So taking in the context of his clothing. Yeah. Why is he playing football in a tie? Right. That's not athletic wear. He's clearly, well, then I wouldn't, you know, you can infer he clearly probably not an athlete. Ooh, all men, extra shame. Yes. Good context. So we've got the pained expression. Somebody mentioned up thread that they actually recognize him or maybe they, uh, they recognize him. This, so just for people who don't know, um, this is a uh, progressive conservative leader, party leader, Robert Stanfield uh, in 1974. And I always like to point out to students that it was before I was born, you know, just so I can remind myself I'm not hugely ancient, not that long before I was born, though. Um, and so when you add the context of the fact that this is a political candidate to the photo, we can already start to imagine how this photo might have been used in order to manipulate his image, in order to manipulate his popularity. Um, and you can ask students why. Why would his ability to play football impact his potential ability to be a member of parliament or be a political leader? I mean, what connection do those two things have? Ah, but wait, his media can often be used to fill in the blanks. So here is the actual caption from the newspaper. This ran in the Globe and Mail in 1974. You can't read the caption, so it's actually reprinted in big, large letters. It says, a political football. It appears that this football is too hot for conservative leader Robert Stanfield to handle. He missed the catch while throwing the ball around in North Bay yesterday. So you can see the newspaper left nothing to chance. It directly linked his ability to lead or be successful in politics, referring to it as a political football, in the headline itself. And so didn't he, wasn't even subtle about it. And so you can imagine the impact that this, and this was on the front page of the newspaper. So you can imagine the fallout. Well, 
Have you ever heard of Robert Stanfield? Does he have an airport named after him? Is he on a dollar bill anywhere? Mm, chances are he probably didn't get elected. And in fact, he did not. Now, how much this photograph actually contributed to his political defeat, we will never know for sure. But I think it's pretty safe to say that it was definitely a factor. Now, questions you can ask students in relation to the newspaper and the choice that the newspaper made to run the caption, run the headline, publish this photo. Um, you know, you can ask students about uh, what do you think the what do you think the intention was? I mean, I basically spelled it out for you. But if you were doing this in class, the object would be to get the kids to tell you, well, what do you think? What do you think the connection is? What do you think the newspaper is trying to say? Um, and do you think it was ethical for the newspaper to publish the image with this caption in the first place? Do we see this kind of news reporting happening in our world today? And I'm sure your students would probably tell you overwhelmingly yes. And is is that is it right? Is it ethical? Should this be happening or should newspapers try to be remain objective? Now, to add an extra fun thing to the mix, you, you could also share this photo with students. So remember, we were talking about photos representing a single moment in time. This photo was also taken on that exact same day. And here we have, rather than having him having judgmental headless bodies in the background watching him drop the ball instead we have you know a symbol of a, a plane in the background and he's making that two-handed catch catching it perfectly um so this picture communicates a much different message about poor robert stanfield unfortunately that's not the one that the newspaper chose to run with and there's the fallout for it. oh he does have a house oh thank you jacqueline and see, you're always going to get students like that, by the way, who are just like, mm, David said, said something. I don't believe her. I'm going to go Google and see what I can find out. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Uh, so imagine if this was so the other thing is so that you can follow up with students with these two images. Now you can ask students, you can say, imagine this was published online today. How quickly would it spread? And adding on to the social media factor now, the fact that we can comment, it's interactive. So how would people comment it? How would it be edited and remixed and reshared in a different form? So visual literacy not means not just being able to analyze the life of an image. It also means to be able to think carefully about what happens or what could happen if that image were to spread. So Janae, could you please come to the office? Janae, come to the office now. Sorry. Uh, so being a good digital citizen is partly about being able to understand and sift through the information we encounter. And it's also about being able to make informed decisions and the consequences of spreading information. Okay, so all really, really important messages to send our kids. So um, in the interest of time, because I can see I only have 12 minutes left, I'm going to whip through this really quickly. And I'm so sorry. We did the fun part of the presentation. Now, this is the part that you guys have been waiting for. Where are the resources? How do I teach this, Davidson? So we have a number of resources available. Civics has a number of resources available on the newsliteracy.ca. So news, N-E-W-S-L-I-T-E-R. ACY.ca. And if you want, you can open another tab and open it now. Uh, and we can actually walk through and I can maybe show you where all the different. Thank you, Kelsey. We can actually walk through and I can show you, but different skills that you might want to highlight for students. Um, I love reverse image search. Um, we were going to do this activity as a group, but just really quickly, I know some of you guys are really fast. Uh, do you think this picture is real or fake? I love asking and kids love this. You know, there's always a massive debate in the culture. It's real, it's fake, it's real, it's fake. That's great. How do we how do we know? How do we go about confirming or disproving or disproving what we think? So if Kelsey's put the link in the chat, if you go to newsliteracy.ca slash bctla, um, it's surprising to me because I just assume this is a thing that everybody knows. But if you are using Google Chrome, and I actually, I heard a rumor that you guys aren't act allowed to use Google. Is that true in BC? No? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Well, some people are saying yes. Some people are saying no. Oh, it depends on the district. Got it. That, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Yeah, in TDSB, we are a full-on Google. We are we are married to Google. We love Google. We've sold our souls. Um, but I do know that other districts don't uh, have it blocked and don't let people use it. Anyways, if you if your kids have access to Google Chrome, if they right-click an image, there's an option there to reverse image search. And what that does is Google will then search for any other instance of that photo being posted online and very quick with the dates that it was shared online and very quickly, it makes it easy to backtrack a photo's timeline on the internet using the years that it was published. So if you have Google Chrome, you can try doing it now. Anyone successfully reverse image search that picture and can confirm whether or not it's real or fake? Yes, Sonia, it's fake. You're right. Very good. And this is an example of an image that is in false context. Okay. And what does that mean? Uh, it's actually a real image. So it, there really was an overpass that had sharks floating. So the image is real. It's not doctored. But the story to which it is attached to, and in this case, it was a shark on the freeway in Houston, that's not where the photo was taken. Uh, and again, if I were doing this in class, I would get the kids to actually try to figure out where the photo is actually from. Um, but this is a very common way that misinformation spreads, especially people who are deliberately trying to spread misinformation. They love to use photos from past events and apply them to new situations. You might be familiar with things like Black Lives Matter protests and where, you know, photographs of damage were posted. But when you reverse image search, it turns out that the damage that was indicated in the, pro in the photo was not from a protest, was not made by protesters, was from some other event. All right. So it's really important skill to teach kids to, again, not always believe what you see. All right. One more. Real or fake? What do we think? Again, you can reverse image check. It's on the same website that was posted. What do we think? Is this guy really covered in bees or is this a doctored image? And yes, B. McFadden is correct. It is real. So it really is a B man. And kids will be like, what? No way. And so again, when they do the reverse image search, that'll send them down. They can also read the article, see where the actual photo is from. And, 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 and so it's, it's a really important skill and, it, and it's really easy to use. It's really quick. All right. Um, so how exactly would you work through the framework with students? Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to go through this super quickly. Um, we see here, here's a photo, okay? Describe the situation. What do I see? I see a field with a whole bunch of garbage in it, all right? Looks like a lot of plastic, a lot of trash. I don't know where it's from. It could be from a concert. It could be from, it could be from a natural disaster. Maybe there's a hurricane. I don't know, all right? Um, now we see the image with text. And the text says, look at the mess today's climate protesters left behind in beautiful Hyde Park. So much plastic, so much landfill, so sad. So how does this change the meaning of the photo? Well, now I now, according, if I'm gonna believe the text, now the text is told, telling me that this was garbage left behind by protesters. It's telling me that this location is Hyde Park, which I believe is in London. Um, it's telling me that, uh, and it's telling me that this was deliberately left behind, okay? Now, again, this is one of those examples where you wouldn't necessarily go through this in order. So notice we started with step one, describe the situation. Step three, interpret the meaning. All right, so the meaning of the photo is now being added to with the text. Uh, I'm gonna skip this slide deck. I'm gonna skip that slide for a second. Uh, the next step two is about looking at the source. And the source is important in this case because it adds to step four, which is what is the meaning? 
So why is this image being shared with this caption? Well, if you look at who is sharing this picture, it's the Australian Youth Coal Coalition. Who are they trying to put in a bad light? They're trying to put in a bad light climate protesters. Okay, so why would the Youth Coal Coalition want to be putting climate protesters in a bad light? So, you know, there's obviously, you know, it, it's there's bias there. People who are advocating on behalf of coal maybe don't look upon climate people who protest climate change favorably, trying to portray them in a bad light, maybe making them, oh, well, look, they protest climate and then they, they protest climate change, but then they create a whole bunch of garbage. And of course, as somebody else has posted in the chat, we don't know that this is in false context. We don't know that this photo is actually representative of the situation that's being uh, described in the picture. Okay. But what we do, what we can do is we can always think about what's the purpose. Why would, even if this picture is, if this picture, whether or not the picture is real or fake, the purpose of sharing the picture is the same. The Australian Youth Coal Coalition is trying to portray climate change protesters in a negative light, okay? So sometimes students will get bogged down as to whether or not it's real or fake. And sometimes you need to recenter them and remind them that, remember part of what we're trying to understand here is yes, the, the what, but why? Why are they sharing this? So we can try to look beyond the, what, the message that we're being immediately presented, okay? Oh, okay. Um, so this is the page on, this is the page on the news literacy website where these activities are specifically located. So first of all, here's the news literacy website. Kelsey put it in the chat. Uh, the homepage I think actually looks different from this now. It's got a different, uh, different, but it's okay. These specific uh, resources that I've shared with you today though, are in the questioning images lesson, you have to make sure that at the top of the screen, first of all, you need to sign up and it's a free, you just need to create an account just so Tivix knows who's accessing their resources, but it's completely free. Um, you need to make sure you have the elementary lesson selected. This page doesn't actually show up under secondary, it's just under elementary. Um, and then it's right at the very bottom. So when you click on the questioning images, all along the right-hand side, there's a slide deck that you can use that has all the images that I've used today, plus more, lots more really great ones. Um, it's got a specific exemplar of the football photo. It's got a specific script. So if you wanna start easy, um, you can download that script and use it with students in your classroom. Um, there's lots of other resources on the page. I'm going to go through them super quickly, but again, you're going to have this slide deck and you can uh, go through this on, on your kind of on your own time and Kelsey's adding the links. Thank you, Kelsey, adding links in the chat. Um, so fake out's one of my favorites. It's uh, a way for kids to be able to do some social media feed analyses without actually having to have a social media feed. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's created by civics. And, um, oh, sorry, fake out's the one where they're given, I'm uh, sorry, I'm thinking of feed for thought. Fake out's the one where you're given a feed, but you have to decide whether or not the information in the feed is true or false. So you're given a first initial just 10, get a score. And then in the middle, there is uh, mini lessons with videos that self play, I can give it to students and they can do it independently. Um, so I used it a lot last year when we were doing remote learning and the kids could progress to the lessons on their own. And then what I really like is there's a checking for understanding. So once they've gone through the lessons, then they get a second feed of 10 posts. And you as the teacher, if you assign it through the news literacy website, you can actually see the difference in score. So you can see uh, right away how much your students have benefited from the lessons. It's really good. Um, and these are just the tutorials that are available on the, on the, uh, throughout the activity. Feed for thought is the one I was really thinking of, which is they give you kind of a fake feed and the fee. So what's interesting is you assign it to the students and spoiler alert, there's actually two different feeds, but the students don't know that. 
there's a feed that's pro an issue and there's a feed that's anti an issue. So the kids read their feeds and then they vote on whether or not they are also pro or for a, a pro or anti a particular issue. And then afterwards, you can actually look at the results and see based on the feed that they got, whether or not the feed affected their decision on whether or not they were also pro or anti uh, the issue. Okay, does that make sense? I feel like I'm explaining these really quickly. But I'm hoping it's enticing you to go check it out for yourself because they really are great. Um, new, something new that they just put up, uh, Factor Opinion, uh, which I really found was important with my kids because they really get confused between what is a fact, something that's provable, something that's verifiable versus an opinion. So this uh, activity walks them through the definition of both and then gives them examples and little mini quizzes so they can kind of test themselves. Uh, Control F is a much larger package of fact checker skills that you guys can use as part of a larger unit about online verification skills. And that is it. So I'm at the end of my slideshow. I am so sorry that uh, we ran out of time for questions. I'm just going to go back and put up my information slide. I know some of I know it's getting up to lunchtime for you guys, and you probably have um, other presentations you need to go to. But this is my contact information. Um, you can email me. You can DM me on Twitter. Kelsey is also here. Kelsey, I gave everyone the hello at civics.ca email address. That's the perfect one. Awesome. Um, if you so have questions. So the newsletter, C, was hello at Control F. I'll just write it in the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, friends. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope you learned a lot. And uh, I hope you have a fantastic weekend, a great day. And thanks for joining us. Bye, everyone.